thank you sir and uh, i must <laughs> really apologize i left home quite some time back but uh, we reached till the south jung fly over and nothing moved after that uh, okay can you hear me now yeah okay okay um well as was mentioned the today's lecture is uh, uh, titled reading or revisit sorry revisiting capital in the age of finance um what i intend to do uh, today is that uh, we know that since its inception and especially over the last 150 years since the publication of the first volume of das kapital uh, capitalism has not merely experienced many crises but has been through Uh, a number of uh, phases in terms of transition or restructuring partly as a result of uh, the sort of uh, changes which were precipitated by the kind of impact which crisis had and uh, partly because of uh, just the evolution in time and the transitions which occurred within capitalism so we normally speak of uh, phases of uh, of one particular kind we speak of uh, things like the mercantilist phase of capitalism the monopoly phase of capitalism and so on but if we take these these this this uh, these 150 years there have been two uh, crises in particular which have had a, a major transformative effect on the kind of capitalism we have or we had the first of course was the the great depression uh, of the 1930s which resulted in a situation where uh, what was put in place as a result of the kind of uh, uh transformation which was state led which came as part of the new deal that what was put in place was uh, a kind of capitalism which reigned in in the first instance finance through the glass steagall act and many other such uh, um, mcfadden pepper act etc but it also resulted in a kind of capitalism in which the state as part of the new deal initially and then after coming out of the crisis as a result of the second world war uh as a result of the influence of keynesianism and so on we had a state which uh, as a result of significant volumes of public expenditure as i mentioned in in an earlier lecture was in a position to be able to sustain substantial growth uh, uh push the system to a situation of near full employment uh, put in place uh, to a certain extent uh, a kind of a welfare state and uh, as i said all of this was in a context in which finance capital had been reined in and therefore we had the golden age which was a period in which we had this unusual coincidence uh, in the history of capitalism of low inflation relatively high rates of growth and extremely low employment unemployment or a near full employment situation but as i mentioned in the last lecture uh, given the antagonistic nature of capitalism uh, we did uh, we we quickly realized in the period after the late 1960s and the early 1970s we realized that this was not sustainable that this was in fact uh, uh, an exceptional phase in the history of capitalism an exceptional phase uh, taking almost its three centuries of history and that uh, we had a kind of restructuring which uh, resulted in the emergence over a period of time of a kind of capitalism which not merely um, limited because of uh, the inflation which occurred uh um, the uh the sort of tendency to sustain a high level of public expenditure which served as the principal stimulus of growth but also began to deregulate uh, the sort of controls which had been put on finance both both in terms of the ability of uh, finance to grow and expand as well as diversify and proliferate into new new areas outside of uh, banking which even in the 1950s and early 1960s in the united states dominated financial activity now if we look at that uh, that process essentially what we had was uh, uh, a major element of the attempt to try and rein in finance in the period after the 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 1930s the banking crisis of 1930 to 32 a major part of it was to try and actually reduce competition within the financial sector in particular at that point of time of course uh, competition between banks uh and this required uh, in it it, it was argued uh, essentially putting significant controls on uh, uh on interest rates because if you didn't have controls on interest rates banks would tend to compete with each other by raising interest rates to attract deposits because a large part of the activity of the banking system is essentially based on uh, 
the money you get from depositors, which uh, banks being the first port of call of the nation's savings. So you actually have a system in which uh, you try and control interest rates such that there is no competition. Uh, and that this results over a period of time in uh, an inability also because of the Glass-Steagall Act and the restrictions it put on banks for banks to finance activities in the non-bank financing sector because banks were prevented from diversifying into securities markets, into insurance and so on. And uh, the result of this, of course, was that you had a not too diversified financial sector, but a financial sector which, uh, which essentially was extremely stable in the period after the, the Second World War and going up to the late 1960s. The problem which occurred is that because of the inability to sustain that exceptional phase of, of, uh, of um, uh, capitalist growth, uh, the golden age, uh, you ended up with a situation where in the late 1960s, the ability to be able to sustain high levels of public expenditure without the system uh, experiencing inflation got undermined. Uh, inflation doubled in the, in the late 1960s. It went even higher in the 70s. Uh, pushed in part by the oil price shocks across the, uh, in, 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 in the, in the oil exporting countries, um, which with oil prices going up 150%. So when you have this significant increase in prices and you have interest rates, which are capped because of the fact that you don't want to have competition between banks, what you really had at that point of time was a crisis in banking because those who were putting their money, their savings into the banking system were finding that the rate of inflation exceeded the rate of interest which was being paid. And therefore, the net return or the real return you got, got after adjusting for inflation was, turned out to be negative so that there was, people started pulling out of their savings from the banking system and attempting to invest it elsewhere. So the whole process of deregulation really began because of the inability of, well, in this case, American capitalism to be able to sustain the kind of unusual coincidence of low rates of inflation, reasonable rates of growth, and uh, relatively low levels of unemployment. When inflation came in, the government had to respond, not merely by trying to pull back its expenditures, but also in terms of beginning to deregulate finance so that the banking crisis could be addressed by the banks trying to find new areas into which they can diversify. Now, this, this triggered off a whole host of changes, uh, which uh, I'm not going to go into in that detail. But essentially, what you had is that uh, when you have interest rate competition, banks obviously tend to now move out of uh, areas, which earlier gives, gave them a, a reasonable but not too high rate of return. If you're pushing up interest rates, you're paying depositors in order to attract capital into the banking system. The cost of capital for the banks goes up. If the cost of capital for the banks goes up, they have to invest or lend to areas where they get higher returns. These areas tend to be areas which are more risky. If they tend to be more risky, they also normally tend to be more volatile. So you ended up with a situation where you had uh, uh, an increase in the fragility in the financial structure and a diversification into more volatile areas. If you went into volatile areas, then obviously you need to do something to deal with risk. And one of the things which happened was that banks decided that they are not going to carry all of the credit assets they create on their books. They decided to try and transfer a part of the risk to others and this set off a process in which credit assets, debt, was really bundled together. Derivative assets or securities were created and these securities were sold on to investors, investors in the insurance business, in mutual funds and so on and so forth. Now, obviously, investing in areas which gives you a higher rate of return obviously means there's a diversification which occurs in the direction of a set of activities which offer higher returns. And these normally tend to be activities like the stock market, the real estate market, and so on. And you tend to find, therefore, the emergence of new kinds of instruments which allows this system to try and deal with the volatility, to deal with the higher level of risk. And you see a whole set of relatively new markets very many new institutions and, of course, a range of new instruments which come into play. And therefore, you begin to see a sharp increase in the extent of financial activity and the share of financial assets and total assets in the system. Now, the point is this, this kind of transition which occurred meant that with the expansion and diversification of financial activity, uh, 
There were multiple sources through which financial players now started earning incomes. In the earlier world, or the, in, the, in the world of, of Glass-Steagall and after, the principal form of return, of course, within the financial sector was the net interest margin, the difference between what banks paid their depositors and what they earned by actually lending out or making investments. But now you began to see new kinds of sources of income, uh, income which essentially came from fee and commissions incomes because of the fact that you were creating these financial products, these, these securities which could be traded. You began to see a certain degree of uh, capital gains, the appreciation of financial assets which, were being, which, were, which, which are now being generated. So you, actually, you, ha you had a situation where it was almost like factories generating financial products, the value appreciating over a period of time and rates of return or earnings in the form of fees, commissions, capital gains, etc., began to become more important than the old ways of earning income within the financial sector. Now, uh, if we look at uh, this form of restructuring which has happened and the transformation which has occurred, therefore, because of what was a crisis of the late 60s and, and the 1970s, the inability of capitalism to be able to, because of its antagonistic nature, to be able to sustain the golden age, that what we had, therefore, is a kind of restructuring which transformed capitalism hugely relative to the way it looked and functioned in Marx's time. Marxist capital was, after all, written in the age of industry. Today, we can say that we live, or people do say, that we live in the age of finance. Now, I mentioned last time that if you look at it in terms of, uh, on the first lecture, that if you look at it in terms of the share of uh, financial activity in, in total national income, it's in the range of about 20% uh, in countries like the, the US and Germany. If you look at the share of financial profits in total, pro in total corporate profits, there's been a significant increase from about 7% to 28% uh, over a period of time. So you actually have a situation in which Finance, to a certain extent, has come to, ex to occupy an extremely important role. But most significantly, what you have, and which is going to be one of the principal concerns which I'm going to address today, is that you begin to observe, first, a much ra faster rate of accumulation of financial assets as opposed to real wealth. And uh, this essentially means that over a period of time, the ratio of financial wealth to real wealth, the ratio of financial assets to GDP, any such set of indices actually points to a situation in which it appears that there is a process of accumulation which is operating outside of the real economy, which results in an accelerated accumulation of financial wealth and financial assets relative to real wealth. Now, this does create a problem as to how we apply Marx's understanding of the sources of profits and the manner of its, of its extraction. Marx was very clear that under capitalism, surplus value was essentially attracted, uh, extracted through the, through, the, through the productive consumption of labor power in combination with whatever constant capital was necessary for the activity being undertaken. This was because of the fact that uh, surplus value in his, in, his, in his analysis and understanding was the difference between the use value of labor power to the capitalist or its application for a full and of course what could be an elastic labor day and the exchange value of that labor power, which is the wage, the difference between the two, or the, the wage needed to reproduce that labor power, the difference between the two was surplus value and it was sourced in production. Now, whatever role money capital and financial intermediaries had, the returns they've received could only be, in that kind of a perspective, a share of that surplus which is generated from production. Much of Marx's discussion was really geared to the different roles money capital assumed and the way in which it managed to extract a return from its activities in terms of a share in the surplus value which is generated in production as a result as i said of this excess or the difference between the uh, the value contributed by labor and the wage of labor or the cost of reproducing labor but in the course of that analysis it appears uh, particularly in 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 volume three but elsewhere as well that there developed various tensions in the analysis in response to which Marx appears to have extended the frontiers of his understanding. When elaborating his core arguments, Marx was at pains to show that money 
exchange and, cir and, and, and circulation distract at attention from the real source of surplus value. So to quote him, in the analysis of the primary form of capital, the form in which it determines the economic organization of modern society, he entirely left out of consideration, and those are his words, what he described as its well-known and so to speak antediluvian forms, merchant's capital and usurer's capital. That is, as discussed in my first lecture, besides locating their operations as subordinate functions in the realm of circulation, where surplus value was only realized, he attempted to relegate them to the primitive phases of capitalism itself. But since merchants and moneylenders must, after all, profit to exist, and the money they withdraw, from, for withdraw as a result of their activity from the market must exceed what they advanced in the first place, the means to that profit needed to be identified. In Marx's view, the only way in which that profit can emerge is if they manage to extract a surplus from their transactions in the sphere of circulation. In the case of merchants' capital, this occurs either because it offers a set of value services needed for the valorization of capital, such as storage, transportation, etc., which are required in part for the, real, for, the, for the extraction and realization of surplus value, or because of the ability of merchant capital to ensure, I mean, to, to, in, to ensure an equal exchange. Merchant's capital in its pure form, according to Marx, appears to be an impossibility as long as equivalents are exchanged. So buying in order to sell, or more accurately, buying in order to sell dearer, the MC M prime circuit, seems admittedly, according to Marx, to be a form peculiar to one kind of capital alone, merchant capital. Matters are even more deviant once we begin to examine usurer's capital. In the case of merchant's capital, money is at, is at the two extremes, but is at least mediated through circulation. There's a money, commodity, money circuit which is involved. But in the case of usurer's capital, you actually don't have this process of intermediation. What you have is the form, MC, the form MC M prime is reduced to unmediated extremes, M, M prime. Money which is exchanged for more money and therefore inexplicable from the standpoint of the exchange of commodities. Marx's understanding of usurer's capital was that it was a primitive form based essentially on the extraction of absolute surplus value. Thus he argued, and I quote him a bit extensively, the distinctive character of the formal subsumption of labor under capital appears at its sharpest if we compare it to situations in which capital is to be found in certain specific subordinate functions, but where it has not emerged as the direct purchaser of labor and as the immediate owner of the process of production, and where in consequence, it has not yet succeeded in becoming the dominant force capable of determining the form of society as a whole as he mentioned earlier. In India, for example, he argued, the capital of the user advances raw materials or tools or even both to the immediate producer in the form of money. The exorbitant interest which it attracts, the interest which irrespective of its magnitude it extorts from the primary producer is just another name for surplus value. It transforms its money into capital by extorting unpaid labor, surplus labor from the immediate producer but it does not intervene in the process of production itself, which proceeds in its traditional fashion as it, as it always had done. There are two aspects to this argument which need noting. The first is recognition that money capital can manage to extract surplus value outside the sphere of production, and this can be in the form of absolute surplus value when capital subordinates production as is and does not transform it, which is what the formal subsumption of labor to capital is. Second, there is the view that this happens only in the stage when capitalism is still emergent and has not seized the process of production. But when performing this parasitic role, it does pave the way for such shiza. This form of extraction of surplus value very often leads to the expropriation of peasants and, and petty producers because they're often forced to sell their meager assets to the usurer to service their debt leaving the producer bereft of the means of production and with no commodity to, to, commodity to sell other than his or her labor power. This too was for Marx a part of the process of primitive accumulation. I've mentioned this earlier too. 
As I discussed earlier, when we go beyond the classic ground of capitalism in England, the evidence suggests that these practices and tendencies continue to prevail in different forms through the history of world capitalism and even today. This implies that when necessary and if possible, finance can extract its share of surplus by using means that do not require the mediation of production. The source of constantly enhanced value must be production, but the appropriation of that surplus can be both through production and outside it. This is all the more possible if profits accruing to money capital take the many forms I had referred to at the beginning of this lecture. Of course, Marx did not end his discussion of money and finance with this reference to the anti diluvian forms, that is of merchants and us usurious capital. Rather, that discussion features in Marx's analysis of capitalism at different levels. To start with, he recognized that the development of circulation under capitalism, that with the development of circulation under capitalism, borrowing and lending, and debtors and creditors emerge, as money takes on the form of means of payment. Besides its, its functions, of course, as means of value, I mean, measure of value and, and, and means of circulation. With credit being a widespread feature in the process of circulation, settlement systems emerge that cancel out implicitly reciprocal payments and require actual circulation of the means of payments only to balance the rest. Nobody carries bags of money to make payments in markets. A lot of them are settled through, through other kinds of instruments and most of these are settled by balancing out the pluses and minuses and the only exchange which takes place in terms of the means of circulation is really what, le what is left in order to be balanced. The greater the gra concentration of amounts that can be settled in one place, the lower would be the amount of the means of payment in circulation. The proliferation of debt now paves the way for the emergence of credit money since certificates of debt soon circulate by transferring the debts of others to others as a substitute for money. Credit becomes tradable. We should, re we should remember that when we talk about securitization in the world of today's finance, this is a classic case of debt becoming tradable because what you do is bu you bundle together different kinds of credit assets, create a der derivative asset which is then traded. So you, you essentially have a situation where there's a large increase in the volume of debt that is traded. Besides facilitating transactions that are separated in time and space, such as, for example, the purchase of cotton production for cloth, and the production and realizing, re realization of va the value of cloth, say, with the long, through the long trade with India, as was happening at that point of time, this role for credit money soon results in a chain of debt. In Marx's words, by and large, money now functions as a mean, only as a means of payment. That is, commodities are not sold for money, but for a written promise to pay at a certain date. For the sake of brevity, we can refer to all these promises to pay as bills of exchange. Until they expire and are due for payment, these bills themselves circulate as means of payment and they form the actual commercial money. To the extent that they ultimately cancel each other out by the balancing of debts and claims, they function absolutely as money, even though there is no final transformation into money proper. So what we act actually have here is a situation where as we move into, an, in, you know, as, as circulation expands, we move into a situation where we have debtors and creditors, we have instruments then which then become tradable instruments and become means of payment rather than merely being IOUs. Then you enter into a world in which actually you begin to see an accumulation of debt which serves multiple purposes, which requires, of course, the emergence of certain kinds of financial intermediaries. As, as these in, in, in instruments proliferate, intermediaries in the, in the form of banks, for example, take over the credit system, <coughs> aggregating capital that, that allows for the provision of cheaper credit on the larger scale demanded by a flourishing capitalist system and mediating the flow of credit money. This buildup of finance, in Marx's view, is amplified by the fact that it is inevitably associated with speculation that results in cred credit creation far in excess of that needed for facilitating circulation. I quote, it is the object of banking to give facilities to trade and whatever gives facilities to trade gives facilities to spe speculation. Trade and speculation are in some cases so nearly allied that it is impossible to say at what precise point 
trade ends and speculation begins. Wherever there are banks, capital is more readily obtained at a cheaper rate. The cheapness of capital gives facilities to speculation just in the same way as the cheap cheapness of beef and of beer gives facilities to gluttony and drunkenness. Marx holds that oper money operating in this manner in the sphere of, of circulation give, gives rise to what he called fictitious capital because in the words of one contemporary observer whom he quotes, it is impossible to decide what part arises out of real bona fide transactions such as actual bargain and sale or what part is fictitious and more mere accommodation paper that is where one bill of exchange is drawn to take up another running in order to, to raise a fictitious capital by creating so much currency. Now this capital is fictitious also because of the fact that it confuses money and capital. The banker has grown, as, has, as Marx said, so gro gro grown so accust accustomed to the view that as and when he lends, he's in some sense creating new capital or at least facilitating the creation of new capital. This of course is not necessarily true. If it so happens that somebody is provided a loan without any collateral, without any uh, uh, security being provided and can use it for the purpose of acquiring commodities, including acquiring commodities and labor power for undertaking, undertaking accumulation, then of course we happen to be in a world in which it could be argued that this is additional capital which is being in some sense created or facilitated or, or capital investment is being facilitated by the provision of credit. But supposing if the ad advance is made against securities or some other such collateral which have to be deposited with the bank, it is an advance in the sense that money is paid to the borrower under conditions of its repayment but is not an advance of capital. For these securities also represent capital, that is the securities which are given as collateral and more, moreover they have to be a higher amount in the advance since a margin is obviously taken into account when providing loans against collateral. The recipient thus less, receives less capital value than he deposits and this is no way an acquisition of extra capital for him. So there is in some sense this confusion or this mixing up of the no idea of money and capital when we actually allow the operation of these, of these intermediaries, particularly banks, to appear as if as and when they, they provide loans that this essentially facilitates additional accumulation and the creation of new capital. If money capital parading but not supporting real transactions or providing additional capital for accumulation is termed as fictitious, then much of modern day finance will qualify as fictitious, especially capital invested in asset-backed securities and derivatives of other kinds. Modern economies seem to be flooded with, even if not dominated, by assets that would qualify as fictitious capital in Marxist terms. The role of many new invest in instruments in modern day finance is really to facilitate the trading of risk and not the debt from which risk is detached. Whether this makes these assets all representatives of fictitious capital is an issue I return to. Meanwhile, in Marx, this sheer expansion of circulation leads to the separation of money, or we can say finance, money capital or finance, that facilitates monetary circulation from that used to gain command over commodities and higher labor power to generate surplus value. In its modern inc incarnation, one independent role for finance appears as that of money dealing capital, which acquires autonomy while performing specific operations involving movements outside the sphere of production. In that role, it appears as a now independent part of the industrial capital in the, in the process of reproduction. Money dealing in its pure form, payments and settlements, exchange business, etc., is separate from the credit system and facilitates monetary circulation needed for and associated with commodity circulation. This capital therefore represents, in Marx's words, on a diminished scale, the additional capital which the merchants and industrial capitalists would otherwise have to advance for this purpose themselves. So the mass of money capital which the money dealers operate with is circulating money capital of the merchants and industrialists and their profit is simply a deduction from surplus value since they're only dealing with the values already realized. So we are still in the realm where the circuit of this kind of capital, which is uh, another form which Marx refers to, is one which actually uh, 
appropriates some surplus which is generated through production, which is generated through the mediation of production. However, Marx distinguishes between these money dealers of pure financial players of that time and the payments made to them and interest bearing capital lending to earn interest under capitalism. In the hands of the money capitalist, the money and means of payment is potential capital and in the hands of the capitalist engaged in production, it is functioning capital. The former capital of course bears interest, the latter generates profit which is part partly paid out to interest bearing capital and the balance retained as the profit of enterprise. The growing role for money capital as an independent form in the hands of independently functioning financial intermediaries soon affects the capital destined, destined to finance production. The borrowing and lending of money becomes the special business of some money lenders. They appear as middlemen between the actual lenders of money capital and the borrowers. This concentrates loan capital with a few financial intermediaries, mainly banks, who are the ones who deal with the borrowers. Overall, and now I quote Marx again, money taken here as the independent expression of a sum of value, whether this exists actually as commodity in, 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 in money or commodities, can be transformed into capital and through the transformation it is turned from a given fixed value into a self-valorizing -val value capable of increasing itself. It produces profit, that, it, that is, it enables the capitalist to extract and appropriate for himself a certain quantity of unpaid labor, surplus product and surplus value. In this way, the money receives, besides the use value which it possesses as money, an additional use value, namely the ability to function as capital. Its use value here consists precisely in the profit it produces when transformed into capital. In this capacity of, pot as poten of potential capital as a means to the production of profit, it becomes a commodity of a special kind. Or what comes to th the same thing, capital becomes a commodity. So if a proprietor pays a lender a portion of the profit thus produced, what he pays for with this is the use value of its capital function. The part of the profit paid in this way is interest, which is nothing but a particular name, a special title, for a part of the profit which the functioning capitalist has to pay to the capitalist, capitalist proprietor instead of pocketing it himself. Thus Marx sees here the restoration of the link between the independent money capitalist and production through the division of surplus into profit and interest. Yet there is much that is being concealed here. Profit of enterprise as a category appears as the payment to the entrepreneur for the work done but that's, that's from Marx, for so the work done as, as a functioning capitalist. And interest is earned as a property, as, 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 as a property stemping, stemming from the ownership of capital. This separation of capital as property bearing interest against as, as against capital as function earning profits results in the profit of enterprise standing, in Marx's words, as antithesis to wages or capital as function not primarily seen as standing in opposition to and exploiting labor, but of profit forming an antithesis to interest. This is an illusion. Marx is still clear that surplus value, whether it takes the form of profits of enterprise uh, or interest must be mediated by capitalist production. In his words, it is utter nonsense to suggest that all capital could be transformed into money capital without the presence of people to buy and valorize the means of production. That is the form in which the entire capital exists aparting, apart from the relatively small part existing in money. Concealed in this idea, moreover, moreover is still greater nonsense that capital could yield interest on the basis of the, cap of the capitalist mode of production without functioning as productive capital that is without creating surplus value of which interest is simply one part. If an inappropriately large number of capitalists sought to transform their capital into money capital, the result would be a tremendous devaluation of money capital and a tremendous fall in the rate of interest. Many people would immediately find themselves in the position of being unable to live on their interest and thus compelled to turn themselves back into industrial capitalists. There are, however, here again, two issues that bear separation. One is the recognition that money capital assumes many autonomous forms, and I've taken you through those forms. 
and find, finds ways of appropriating, even if not generating surplus value while engaging in activities that involve no mediation of production. The second is the notion that the illusion that money can beget money, that the expansion of finance creates is merely a form of fetishism. In volume three, Marx notes that in the form of interest bearing capital, capital appears immediately in this form, unmediated by the production and cir circulation processes. Capital, is, capital appears as a mysterious and self-creating source of interest of its own increase. The thing, money, commodity, value is now already capital simply as a thing. The result of the overall production process appears as a pro property devolving on the thing itself. This, according to Marx, also creates the illusion that accumulation has no limits. The identity of surplus value and surplus labor sets a qualitative limit to the accumulation of capital. This comes from the total working day, the, or the length of the total working day, the, present, the, the extent of development of productive forces, the size of the population, all of which, which limit the number of working days that can be simultaneously exploited. But if surplus value is conceived in the irrational form of interest, the only limit is quantitative. So it is not just that quantitative in the sense that you have a certain amount of money and depending upon the amount of money you have, given a certain rate of interest, it will accumulate itself to some larger value M prime. So it is not just that surplus value is, gener is generated in production, it is also that the proliferation of credit money and other forms of speculative finance is in part fictitious and conceals the real antagonism inherent in capitalist production. The focus on these extremely important features of money capital meant that Marx spent little time addressing the tension in capital itself between the recognition of the rapid pace of expansion and proliferation of finance and the notion that this is insubstantial, is not central to the generation of surplus value as in, and in some senses is an illusion in a form of fetishism. The, this tension in Marx's analysis is reflected in the fact that while he gave primacy to extraction of surplus value in production, he, he had to recognize the then just emerging complexities in the world of money and finance, which result in the appropriation of various functions in the circuit of inter industrial capital by independent forms of money capital. This makes money capital crucial to the process of production and appropriation of surplus value, to the unity of production and circulation as he called it, and cast, can vastly increase the share of aggregate profits accruing to money capital. The problem is that as Marx himself saw it, so long as financial assets are liquid, that is they can be traded or can be sold in functioning markets for forms of immediate purchasing power and the value of money is stable, they can be used to purchase commodities including labor power of an equivalent value. And those commodities can be put to use to generate surplus value. So their value is not at all an illusion. To treat that capital as fictitious then is to ignore the role it can play in accumulation if it chooses to. These possibilities are amplified in the age of finance. If the development or evolution of capitalism involves handlers of money capital assuming multiple roles as money dealers, credit intermediaries, money capitalists and banks, more recent transitions that generate a whole world of financial de uh, uh, whole world of financial dealers engaged in handling money capital invested in financial assets do not exploit not just interest and fee income but also capital gains where, in, where investments appreciate and wealth begets more wealth without the in intervention of commodities and or circulation can be seen as an inten intensification of the trend that Marx himself had observed. However, instead of independent money capital retaining a link with production, as happens in the case of interest bearing capital and capital in, 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 as, as, as functioning capital, instead of independent money capital retaining a link with production, it appears to feed on itself. The divergence between real and financial accumulation seems to widen. One issue is whether the surpluses earned by finance capital are being generated in the financial sector rather than being appropri appropriated through it. Given the understanding of the source of surplus value, it cannot be argued that this surplus originates in the financial sphere or in circulation. But it is possible that, that the surplus is appropri appropriated outside of it 
which Watson himself recognized, and without the medi mediation of production, as was true of usurer's cap capi uh, capital and often in the form of surplus value. An extreme example of this in the present day world is, 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 is the, the case of and the fascination with inclusive finance. It is in the nature of modern finance that it's, it seeks to subordinate all realms of economic activity to it so as to extract some surplus from them, either as interest or in the form of foreclosed assets. So private finance in a neoliberal world does not walk away from the bottom of the pyramid, even in rural areas, but finds new ways of subordinating its constituents to reach small enterprises, marginal farmers, and poor borrowers. Innovations of various kinds have been experimented with. Some are obvious, such as the use of business correspondence and banking facilitators as conduits for credit in locations where it does not make sense to, to establish brick and mortar banking facilities. Being local, these agents are better informed of, about their clients and more ca capable of gathering the information needed for viable lending. These agents deliver loans to primary borrowers and are in turn supported with lines of credit from the banks which reach to cre credit to small borrowers in the process. Loans are not only for productive purposes but are used to finance some consumption expenditures or special needs such as emergency health expenditures. But rates often compare with those charged by usur usurious money lenders. What is being extracted here is absolute surplus value by squeezing out a share of meager earnings of those who choose to smoothen their consumption using access to these financial services. The, the other approach to these, to these borrowers is through the reliance on microfinance companies. In that world, group lending or the joint liability mechanism provides an implicit loan guarantee and promises high recovery. In addition, peer pressure driven by the fact that individuals defaults affect the credibility as a, of the group as a whole ensure high rates of recovery. These institutional innovations have in turn been backed up with pure financial innovations such as sec securitization drawn from the world of macro finance. This helps enlarge the volume of credit then can, can be profitably delivered to those who need to be financially included. The logic of this system is often hard to understand. Loans of this kind to small and poor borrowers, often remotely located, are more prone to default given the economic conditions of many of these micro borrowers and the evidence that borrowers take on loans from multi multiple sources or use loans from one to pay off dues to the other. The only way this trend can be explained is that lenders expect that in case of default, the probability of which is high, there are assets available that can be seized in the, ca in, in, in the case of, of, of large scale default, a form of primitive accumulation that transforms financial wealth into real wealth. The much faster relative expansion of the size of finance relative to real wealth in contemporary capitalism also gives the former far more autonomy than Marx envisaged. This makes it far more difficult to explain. Marx recognized that the expansion of interest-bearing capital results in a degree of independence of money capital. He recognized that money capital gives command over labor, but does not extend this to a full analysis of the relationship between financial and real accumulation. As I mentioned, so long as the market for financial assets is liquid, he himself maintained, and the value of money is stable, illusory gains do give command over real assets. In his time, Marx sought a resolution to this problem, this problem of the fact that you're observing this divergence between real and financial wealth, which of course had occurred only to a certain extent in his time, which was the age of industry. Marx, Marx sought a resolution to the problem of the observed diversion, be, divergence between real and financial asset accumulation in the role he attributes to crises that are inevitable when this rise of finance reaches unsustainable levels. Crisis result in an unwinding of unsustainable cre credit and a collapse in the value of financial assets. These crises of overproduction, while occurring because of the antagonistic nature of capitalist production, are partly the result of the growth of finance, of credit driving the system to its limits. This is because, this is because Marx argues, credit offers the individual capitalist or the person who can pass as a capitalist an absolute command over the capital and property of others within certain limits. And, this over, and through this, the command over other people's labor. It is disposable over social capital rather than his own 
that gives him command over social labor. The actual capital that someone possesses or is taken to possess by public opinion now becomes simply the basis for a superstructure of credit. The argument is that the credit system, by allowing those other than the owners of capital control over so social capital to apply it to production and speculation, stretches the process of expanded production to its limits. These investors are, are therefore willing to proceed quite unlike owners who, when they function themselves, anxiously weigh the limits of their private capital. This only goes to show how the valorization of capital founded on the antithetical character of capitalist production permits actual free development only up to a certain point, which is constantly broken through, on the other hand, through the credit system where people get control over social capital. But this also means that credit precipitates the violent crisis by stretching the system to its, to its limits. The violent crisis implicit in this contradictory social formation and to the extent that crisis results in the collapse of asset values, which are particularly financial assets which are traded, you end up with a situation where there's implicitly some balance being restored between real capital accumulation and financial capital accumulation. In contemporary capitalism, however, even if accumulation of financial capital leads to crisis, it does not necessarily wipe out all past capital gains. One reason for this is that a financial crisis threatens to freeze the payments and settlement system and close the credit pipe, both of which are crucial for the circuit of capital and the functioning of capitalism. These externalities of financial crisis are too significant for the state to ignore. In the event, in all major crises involving a crisis of the financial system, governments and central banks intervene to restore stability and profits in the financial system by injecting taxpayers' money or in essence by socializing losses. In fact, across crises, the rising flow set to the, set to the value of wealth accumulated in the financial sector raises the share of financial assets to real wealth substantially, as the evidence shows. Thus, financial speculation uh, of this kind delivered substantial profits and constituted, therefore, another mode of capital accumulation for individual capitalists because you don't have the full adjustment of the divergence between real and financial wealth because of the intervention of the state, the socialization of losses, often by just the creation of money or by the use of, of taxpayers' money. At least a part of this wealth was paper wealth and illusionary illusionary, of course. When bu bubbles burst, some of this capital just vanished. But that vac val value is quickly rebuilt with the aid of the state and the resulting financial overhang appropriated and re redistributed in favor of financial capital through multiple means. I mean, overhang appropriates and redistributes in favor of financial capital through multiple means, a range of surpluses generated elsewhere in the economy that is in production. But this divergence between real wealth, which can be commanded by finance, and financial wealth generated through multiple means, cannot remain unbridged. For in order that finance can command real wealth, such wealth of equivalent value must exist. If the production of financial wealth occurs faster than that of real wealth available to be traded in the market, then new sources of real wealth must be found. One source is, of course, the privatization of public sector assets which makes available wealth accumulated through the investment of the social surplus to private capital. The second is to privatize common property resources and make them means for the self-expansion of value. Land, water, forest, spectrum, and perhaps the ocean, hitherto treated outside the domain of private ownership, are converted into assets that can be privately owned and traded, enhancing the quantum of re real wealth that can be commanded. Finally, the operations of finance can be used as a means to expropriate assets that can then be commanded by financial capital, as we saw was the case with the so-called inclu inclusive finance of today. What this suggests is that the divergence in the rates of growth of financial and real assets can remain large and even continue rising so long as the state presents itself as a site for primitive accumulation Means of appropriation in the form of surplus value can be found by capital standing outside production, and real assets are continuously appropriated and released back, uh, released to back the financial wealth 
which is only partly eroded in the course of capitalism's periodic crisis. In this sense, not all of capital is fictitious, so long as this process can, conti con can continue. It, is, it only is a claim on real wealth that must be unearthed or expropriated. The process will continue so long as finance capital dominates. Since capitalism does not collapse, the process can continue till either another crisis restructures capitalism in ways that undermines finance, as the New Deal did, or political developments lead to the transcendence of capitalism. What I would do in the next lecture is really try and look at the crisis of 2007-8 as an example of possibilities, if at all, of this kind of a restructuring. Thank you.